Pastor Chris, this is Didi. Welcome to our home. Uh, at least one more time. Hope, who knows? Maybe this will be the last Sunday. Uh, I'm trusting God in that. We did receive some equipment this week that we need to start live streaming from church, but we're still waiting for others. So just be in prayer about that. We're trusting God in that process. Meanwhile, we're glad that we have this platform that works. We're glad you're here with us today. We're about to go into worship. Um, every once in a while, I give a little quick blurb about worship. And one of the most profound things about worship is that it means to ascribe worth. It means that we're telling God, you're worth my attention. You're worth me setting down this and my phone and all the distractions and all the different, you're, you're, worth, you're worth my focus. You're worth these songs. You are worthy of the, of my, of these things that I'm focusing on in my heart. You're worthy of my full energy right now. And that's really what worship means. But I don't know about you, but it's, Sometimes it's hard with all the distractions going on, isn't it? There's a lot going on in our world. Just a few weeks ago, it was all about the coronavirus. Now we have so many other things concerning us and as nation, some crazy things happening. How do we worship with all this stuff going on? How do we focus with all these concerns? How do we even have hope and, and, and know that God is still, still in control? How do we hope for any, anything good to come out of this? We're praying for God to heal our land, but sometimes it seems like it goes the opposite direction, doesn't it? So I want to share something really quick. This morning in my own devotional time, I was just really focusing on 2 Chronicles 7, 14. And many of us have heard that, very familiar with it. If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray, if they will seek my face, and turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven and I will heal their land. It's so easy to think that healing our land is going to come when certain things are fixed. God, you know, God, when are you going to stop this from happening? And look at what those people over there are doing, Lord. And if this would just stop, if those people would just, if this would happen, if that would happen, if this would stop happening, then healing could come to our land. That scripture doesn't say any of that. <laughs> It doesn't say when things settle down, I will hear from heaven and heal their land. Notice it also doesn't say if all the people of the world will humble themselves. Boy, that would be nice, wouldn't it? But I think we might want to pack a lunch if we're waiting for that to happen, right? What does it say? If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray, if they will seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven. Then I will heal their land. Did you get that? We, the remnant, God's people, we have the ability to bring revival and healing to this land. That's awesome. We need to get that. Stop waiting for the world to come around. Stop waiting for people to agree with you. Stop waiting for peace in this whole thing. Peace is going to come when God's people take him up on that offer. Seek his face. Humble ourselves, first of all. That means lay it all down. God, it's you first, Lord. It's humbling ourselves means deferring to him completely. God, it's you. It's all about you, Lord. If you don't move, we're dead anyway, God. Then meanwhile, Lord, just work on my heart. Seek his face. Turn from our wicked ways. That's the repentance that we often talk about, changing our direction. Not only saying, God, I'm sorry, but literally changing things. God wants to change us during this time, guys. Seek his face. Then he will hear from heaven and heal our land. So we have the ability to do that, guys. Just remember that as we're worshiping, we're ascribing worth, we're saying, God, you're worthy of all of that. And, and have that humble attitude that I just described in 2 Chronicles 7, 14. Pray for our nation, yes. But most of all, go after it yourselves. Amen. We are the church, and God, we, God has given us the ability to move his heart. Till I lay my head, oh, I 
that again. sing of your goodness, Lord. Thank you, Father, for your goodness. Thank you for your love. Thank you for your patience with us, Lord. And Father, I want to do exactly what I mentioned a minute ago, Father. I want to humble myself, Lord. I want to pray, Father, on behalf of myself, on behalf of our church, on behalf of our city, on behalf of our nation, Lord. Father, we, we humble ourselves, Lord. We give us that heart, Lord, that is deferred to you, Lord God, and to and not on ourselves, and not even on circumstances, Lord, that is focused on you. Show us, Father, the attitudes and the habits and the things that are still displeasing to you, Lord, that need to be laid down during this time. Forgive us, Lord God. Forgive me, Father. Let repentance, let healing, let revival start with me. Heal me, Lord. Forgive me, Lord. And surely, Father, heal our land. Heal our nation. Heal first, though, our hearts. Heal our marriages. Heal our homes. Heal this city. Heal Crossover Church of God. Heal our land, Father, we pray. In Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Who brings the power to sin and darkness? Whose love is mighty and so much stronger? King of glory, King of glory. Who shakes the whole earth with holy thunder? Who leaves us breathless in all and wonder? The King of glory, the King of glory. This is amazing.
You are worthy, worthy. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Worthy is the King who conquered the grave. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. You are worthy, worthy. This is amazing grace. This is a Thank you. 
Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Actually, we're going to pray there for a second. <laughs> I, um, yeah, I'm thankful that he hasn't failed us, aren't you? Amen. I'm thankful for Dee Dee that she has risen to the occasion during this time. There's an old saying that uh, we're like tea bags. We find out what we're made of when we're in hot water. And um, she has risen in confidence and boldness in the Lord. And even doing this every Sunday with me like this. I'm used to being in front of people. She's not. And uh, she really stepped up. And I really appreciate that. And God's calling her to a new place of, of ministry. She has something to say. She has something to offer. And I'm thankful that God is raising her up in boldness and giving her that God confidence. I'm also thankful for behind those that are uh, other ones that are behind the scenes. Uh, Melissa Fraka, wherever you are out there. Thank you. Thank you, Melissa. So much happens behind the scenes that Melissa helps with. And she's just one of those unsung heroes. Uh, she posts my notes on Facebook and Google Docs ahead of time. She also floats the uh, songs down below when we're singing on Sunday mornings. We're very, very dedicated to that. And I really thank you for that, Melissa. Uh, pardon? And she does, yeah, she also manages our YouTube channel. And so I'm very thankful for that. Um, I, I'm just saying these things because it feels, to me, it feels like we're coming to the end of this season. And that season being work, worshiping out of our home. We've been very thankful for the equipment. We've been very thankful for those that stepped up, Dee, and even Phil that lives with Dee. He's been so helpful in helping us get this equipment set up. And um, we're very, very thankful for that season that we've had here where I've been able to just invite you into our home, and we've continued to have church just in a slightly different way. It feels, it just, it just feels to me like we're on our way into a new season. I, I bet it does with you too. Bless you guys. Uh, I do indeed have something to share with you today. I hope it blesses you. Uh, in Paul's letter to the Colossian church, I'm going to show you here in a minute. I'm going to be reading out of Colossians 1. And the church of Colossae was one of the churches that Paul had started. And in his letter to the Colossians, he started off the letter with thanksgiving and prayer for them. And he said this. He said, we always thank, thank God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, when we pray for you because we have heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and of the love you have for all God's people. The faith and love that spring from the hope stored up for you in heaven and about which you have already heard in the true message of the gospel. Look at this. We get faith, love, and hope working together. Did you see that? Each one of them building the other, faith building love, faith building hope. Love building faith, love building hope, etc. In fact, in Paul's church to the Corinthian church, or excuse me, Paul's letter to the Corinthian church, he wrote what we call now the love chapter in 1 Corinthians 13. It's quoted oftentimes through in weddings. And when he talked about the different things of the aspects of being in the kingdom, he said these three things remain faith hope, and love. So that's how it's supposed to be for a believer. And that's why I titled today's message, Faith Builds Hope. So here is a trustworthy statement I want to come out of the shoot with, and that is this. You can't hope in anything that you don't have faith in. I mean, it almost stands to reason. That's such an obvious statement. You can't hope in anything that you don't have faith in. Let me give you some examples. I hope it rains tomorrow, but it probably won't. That's not really faith. That's not really hope, is it? <laughs> Here's another one. I hope I do well on that test at school, but I probably won't. I never do. That's not faith. That's not hope. And really, when you want to tie it into where we are right now, guys, I hope God comes through and heals our nation like we prayed, but he probably won't. It looks like it's just going to the wayside. It looks like these crazy people are taking over, blah, 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 all these things. No, no, no. See, that's not faith, and that's not hope. 
reminds me of Eeyore and the old Winnie the Pooh series. Love Eeyore. Good morning, Eeyore. And he would say something like this. If it is a good morning, which I doubt. Guys, lousy Eeyore imitation, but good theology. See, that's not faith. That's not hope. And that is not what God is calling us to. The Bible says in Hebrews 11.1 1, that faith is confidence in what we hope for and assurance about what we do not see. I tell you what, it's easy to look around in this world right now, right? I mean, I, I go back and forth. Sometimes I just get tired of watching the news. I mean, all it is is just such negative and just, oh, just up, upheaval. Where is there anything good going on? God, help us. But then on the other hand, I don't want to be, I don't want to bury my head in the sand. I need to know what's going on. It's a tough balance. But see, if I'm hoping, if I'm placing my faith and I'm, if I'm placing my hope in circumstances, then I will be sorely disappointed when I look around. If I'm placing my hope and my faith in politicians, oh, Lord, help us. What else do we place our hope in? Our money. Well, look at what's going on, man. This COVID-19 sure showed that in just a moment's time, our stock market could be crippled. We could be sent into a recession with, with several different things going on. We're putting our hope in, our, in these statutes and just the tradition of the American dream, the American, uh, the Americana, the slice of Americana that we all, many of us grew up with, the American dream, as it were. Well, that's being questioned now. We're in that mode now where everything is suspect and everything is, is, is on the table and looked at. We're putting our hope in that. Again, Hebrews 11.1, 1, faith is confident in what we hope for and assurance of what we do not see. That tells me that biblical hope, guys, is faith in action. In other words, the very definition of hope, as the Bible describes it, is faith in action putting our money where our mouth is, stepping up and saying, God, I don't care what's going on right now. I believe just what we read, that you can move a mountain, and I believe I'll see you do it again. Hallelujah. See, there's a reason why these songs that we just sang, they're, they're just very, very timely. I believe that I'll see the goodness of God. That first song. Oh, I love that psalm where David said, I remain confident of this. I will see the goodness of God or the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. That means night right now, right now, right now. We're here where we are, not, not in the here and the ever after. Yeah, we'll see it up in heaven. But we'll see the goodness of God. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stand in that, guys. And that is faith in action. And that really is what biblical hope is. I want to look today at a character in the Bible. I'm not going to show any notes here for a while. I just want you to listen to me here because it's way too much to describe and read to you the story of Joseph. I just encourage you, if you want to read on your own, he's mentioned in chapters 37 through 50 of the book of Genesis. His story really goes back to Father Abraham. Abraham, God appeared to Abraham and said, I, from you, I will, I will, uh, there will be many, many, many descendants. Many nations will follow. I mean, he is a God of our nation. He's a God of God. He was the, excuse me, he was the father of God's people. Through him, God uh, created a beautiful lineage, tracing back all the way to him. And he gave him that awesome promise of, of bearing a son, even though he was 100 years old. And his wife, Sarah, was 90 years old. So here comes Isaac, the miracle baby. God's promises are true. Great is your faithfulness, Lord. Your promise still stands. And then Isaac had a couple of sons, one of them being Jacob, whose name was later changed to Israel. And he was the literally the, the patriarch of the Israel nation, Israeli nation. And he had 12 sons that ended up being describing or formulating the 12 tribes of Judah. One of those sons was Joseph. And the Bible describes him as uh, being his father's favorite. 
father loved Joseph. There was just something about Joseph that his father loved and his brothers were highly jealous of him. In fact, they hated him for that. Their father gave Joseph a robe of many colors, of many brilliant colors. Didn't give the brothers one. And so one day, I'm, I'm really summarizing the story here. One day his brothers conspired because of their jealousy and their hatred of their brother, they conspired to kill him. But Reuben stepped in, one of the brothers, one of the older brothers stepped in and saved him and said, no, 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 let's not kill him. Then his blood will be on our hands. Let's, let's just throw him in this hole on the ground. And that's what they did. And he had plans to come back later and rescue him. But meanwhile, the other brothers saw a band of marauders, of, 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 of uh, tradesmen going through, and they sold their brother Joseph to those tradesmen, those traveling tradesmen, as a slave. And he was taken into Egypt and sold as a slave. But God was with him, and God had favor on Joseph, even in that. And he eventually ended up in a man named Potiphar's house, who was the leader of the, uh, the armed guard, the Egyptian armed guard, man of high rank, a lot of power. And he quickly rose to prominence, even within Potiphar's house. God had his favor, hand of favor on Joseph, even then. And if you know the story, you know that Potiphar's wife one day took a liking to Joseph, thought that he was attractive and and uh, decided to have her way with him. But Joseph wouldn't have it, and he ran from the scene. Potiphar's wife did not like to be embarrassed like that, so she told all the officials that Joseph tried to rape her and ran out uh, when she fought him off. They believed her, of course, over him and threw him in jail in the dungeon. But, it, but interestingly enough, in the years that he spent in the dungeon, God had his hand of favor even there on him. And it was told about him that he could interpret dreams. And Pharaoh, the leader of Egypt, was having nightmares and dreams that he could, even his own, his own aides, his own advisors could not interpret. And so they, somebody told him about Joseph. Hey, there's this guy in prison, in jail, way down in the, in the dungeon, that can interpret dreams, why don't you call him up? And Joseph indeed did interpret the dreams. And he said to Pharaoh, there's going to be seven years of prosperity, then seven years of famine. And that's exactly what the dream meant. And, and, and Potiphar, I mean, uh, excuse me, Pharaoh was impressed by Joseph and literally made him second in command of Egypt. And Joseph was indeed the leader of that whole, he was the brainchild of this effort for seven years to collect all the grain from the good years and store it for that coming drought and, and that famine that was coming. And sure enough, the famine and the drought did come and there was no food in the land. And now Egypt was this place of food for all the regions around, including where Jacob and his sons were. So Jacob sent his sons into Egypt to try to get some food, and they come face to face with who else? Joseph. See, I want to tell you guys something here. The story of Joseph was in the Bible for a reason. More, it's more than just an interesting story. It's more than just fodder for a, a snappy Broadway musical, the, the man of the coat of many colors, or whatever that was. It got here's a kingdom principle that thousands of years later, guys we need to grab a hold of, and that is this. God gives a promise, then there is a waiting time, a time of trial and testing, and that waiting time is for our good, but is also allows, unfortunately, the enemy, Satan, time to come in and try to get us focused just on the trial and not, off of, not on God. And that it is exactly where we are right now, guys. Exactly. Satan is trying to get you focused on what people are doing, and the rioting, and on this, and that, and the COVID, and this, the, uh, just whatever it is. Those people, whoever those people are to you, as long as you can focus on them, you're taking your eyes off of God, and that's exactly what he's doing right now. 
You see, it would have been very easy for, and very natural, by the way, for Joseph to forget all about God, to forget about the dreams that God had given him, and to focus just on the situation, and more than that, to focus on revenge. If there was anybody that had um, a justification for revenge, it was Joseph. But instead, in Genesis 50, verse 20, we see the heart of Joseph. <clears throat> we see the God-focused attitude that Joseph had when he said these infamous words. He said these, when his brothers went to see him and they discovered that it was him, he said these words, you intended to harm me, but God intended it for good to accomplish what is now being done, the saving of many lives. Now, Joseph had a pretty rotten gig there. That guy, years and years and years in prison. Done wrong, mistreated, falsely accused. He would, have been, he would have had such a reason to live in the past, to lick his wound, poor me, but you don't see that here at all. And in a moment's time, God took him from the dungeon to second in command of Egypt. We've got to get that, guys. See, he placed his faith in God's greater purpose, and he built his hope on that. We need to do that right now, guys. We need to place our faith in God's greater purpose in all of this. Nothing happens in this world that God is not working in. You better believe on that. Nothing's out of his control. He, didn't take, he did not abdicate his throne for a moment in all that's going on right now in our nation. And Joseph could have easily allowed himself, get this, to be paralyzed by his past. We talked about paralyzed last week. Remember, the idea of paralyzed is to make something powerless or ineffective. Something that used to have function now no longer has that function. Somebody that's paralyzed could walk before, now they can't. It would have been very easy to be to Joseph, let jo, uh, for Joseph to allow himself to be paralyzed by this. And by the way, did you know the enemy wants you to be paralyzed? You better believe he does. Satan wants us to wallow in our past. He wants us to lick our wounds. He wants to wallow in our hurts. He wants us to rehearse our failures. He wants to live and our bad decisions. He wants us to give up, and he wants to give up. He wants us to give up on our hopes, on our dreams, and give up on ourselves. And mostly, he wants us to give up on God. Don't you dare give up on God. See, the Bible says that instead of giving in, Joseph remained in faith and hope and was instead, get this, reconciled and reunited with his brothers and family. In other words, he saw his dream happen. Read about it. Genesis 37 through 50. It is, you can't write a saga for TV better than this story. See, again, though, getting it back to Joseph, instead of dwelling on his dilemma, Joseph focused on his faith that God had a plan, and then he submitted himself to that plan. That is good for us to hear today, guys. And that plan, once he submitted to it, gave him the hope that he stood in. What got Joseph through all those years in the prison? I have no idea. There was even hope at one point because one of the prisoners that he had spent some time with was getting out. And he said, hey, when you get out, man, put in a good word for me. But the Bible says that once he got out, his friend kind of conveniently forgot all about Joseph. And he was in there two more years after that. Can you imagine? It would have been so easy to give in to hope or give in to uh, toss it in, give in to despair. But he didn't. He held on to the hope. And again, uh, that Genesis 50, 20 tells where his attitude was. You intended to harm me, but God intended it for good to accomplish what is now being done, the saving of many lives. See, it takes faith, guys, to understand that concept. It takes hope to stand in it. Here's another uh, saying here that we need to, Kind of take note of, faith always gives us hope. When you stand in faith, you have no choice but to have your hope muscles strengthened. Faith always gives us hope. And likewise, here is another kingdom principle. The miracle is God's part. Faith is our part. See, God partners with us. We say, God, heal our land. Well, he's going to ask you something. He's not going to just say, okay, you just kick back and just do whatever you want, let your mind run wild, and 
and just be part of the problem instead of the solution. No, he's going to say, okay, I want you to check your own heart. I want you to bring yourself to the altar. See, God's part's a miracle. Our part is faith and, and, and obedience and cooperation. Because here's the truth, guys, is that God can do the greatest miracle it is there is out there. He can rescue us. He can forgive us. He can heal us. He can set us free. He can set us on fire for him. But if we do not have the faith to believe in God and to believe in his power, uh, then it will all be for naught. Because we'll give up on hope and we'll just go right back to our self-destructive mindsets. That's what we do. I like this quote from Martin Luther. It says, God our Father has made all things depend on faith so that whoever has faith will have everything and whoever does not have faith will have nothing. Wow, Martin Luther, chill out, man. It's kind of closed-minded. No, that's the truth. Whoever has faith has everything. Whoever does not have faith has nothing. Bottom line, guys. Faith is required to see the move of God in our lives. Faith is required to see the move of God in our lives. I won't ask you to turn there, but there's a chapter in the book of Hebrews called the faith chapter. And you just, I encourage you to read that. It talks about some of the patriarchs and some of the heroes that have gone before us. Noah, by faith, Noah built an ark to save his family. Did you know it had not rained on the earth before that? A lot of us don't know that. It literally, the Bible says that the, before that, God had watered the earth from below. It bubbled up from below. And now he's building this ark out in the middle of nowhere. There's not, well, there, there no water in sight. By faith, he did that because God told him to do it. By faith, Moses' parents hid him for three months after he was born. By faith, Moses led God, God's people out of Egypt. By faith, the walls of Jericho fell on and on and on and on. It takes faith to see the move of God in our lives. So maybe you're saying, I don't know about this faith thing, Pastor. I'm not much of a faith person. I think I have pretty weak faith. I, I disagree with you. You just have selective faith. See, we have impeccable faith with things that don't, don't really challenge us to the core of who we are. You have faith when you switch, switch on the light. The, uh, the switch on the wall for the light. You have full faith and confidence that light's going to come on, and when it doesn't, you go, ah, did I change the bulb? You have faith when you when you stick your car key in the ignition that your engine's going to start. You have faith when you drive down the street, separated from traffic, going the opposite direction by only a painted line in the pavement. Are you kidding? And one of the uh, one of the illustrations I often use, which is funny, is that when you go to McDonald's and you buy that Big Mac. You don't ask to go to take a tour of the kitchen and interview all the people that had a part of that Big Mac and ask them to make sure that it was cooked at the right temperature and that all their cleanliness procedures were correct and per the manual. You bite right into that Big Mac when you bite it. You have complete faith in that. See, we have faith. It's just selective faith. The better question to ask ourselves is this. What is the kind of faith that God can work with? What is the kind of faith that God can work with? Because, guys, that's a very fitting question for the times that we live in now. So I just want to, in the time I have remaining, I just want to talk about faith in a practical sense. Because it's easy to say, okay, i got to have more faith. What does that mean? I cross, cross my fingers. Oh, I hope upon a star. That's not faith. Faith, in a biblical sense, faith starts with, it's just like a simple statement that says, God, I need you desperately. That's where it starts, guys. God, I need you, Lord. I don't understand any of this. God, I need you desperately. That takes faith to do that. That's, a, that's the beginning. That's good. I encourage you to do that this week. Maybe today. John Calvin said that faith looks away from oneself and to God alone for help. Get that, alone. Boy, the operative word is alone. God alone. We need to be focused on God, guys, now more than ever. 
And I might add, this takes a choice in order to do that. Faith is a choice. So here's a few more statements about faith. Faith is taking God at his word. That's literally what faith means, just taking God at his word and finding hope in that. Faith is confidence in God, a strong confidence in God. David wrote again, one of my favorite Psalms, I remain confident of this. And the end of Psalm 27, I remain confident of this. I will see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Guys, that's confidence in God. That's faith. And he found hope in it. Here's another one. Faith is a firm conviction that God will deliver on his promise. In other words, it's a firm conviction that God is who he says he is, that he'll do what he said he can do. And again, we find the much-needed hope that we need in that confidence. And lastly, here's another statement. <clears throat> Faith is God-focused. We need to hear that right now more than ever because it's so easy to be circumstance-focused. It's so easy to look around, read the news, look at the at Facebook of what's going on, it is so easy to be focused on that. But that's not faith. Faith is God-focused. It's not emotion-focused either, by the way. Well, I feel this. I feel that. Well, okay, that's not faith either. Faith doesn't sway with the trends. It doesn't sway with the talking heads. It doesn't. It's not influenced by setbacks either. I tell you what, guys, faith is absolutely key in the life of a Christian. Think about that. First of all, it was key in your original salvation, wasn't it? It's by faith that we are saved. And now it takes faith in seeing God's miraculous work in our lives. It takes faith to say, God, forgive me. I come to you, Lord, with a humble heart. Lord, search my heart. Show me, Lord, anything, any anxious thoughts or anything in there that's not pleasing to you, Lord. Lead me in the way everlasting. That takes faith. Did you know that the Bible says in Hebrews eleven six, without faith, is it is impossible to please God because anyone who comes to him must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who earnestly seek him. But see, you can't earnestly seek him when you're earnestly looking around at other things. When you're earnestly wringing your hands, when you're earnestly worrying, when you're earnestly saying, yeah, but those people, and yeah, but this, yeah, but this, Lord. No, seeking him means we're having the faith to believe, first of all, that he exists, and that he rewards those who earnestly seek him. That means focusing on him and going after him. And getting back to Joseph, I, I think that Joseph had that kind of faith, guys. But more than that, Joseph had an active faith in God. What, I, what do I mean by active faith? I mean it was more than head knowledge. You know, we got our churchy sayings. You know, we're all full of those, well, you know, God is good all the time, and all the time God's good. You know, meanwhile, our lives are in shambles. Meanwhile, we're giving into this, living in the past, doing this, and licking our wounds and, and rehearsing anger and harboring resentments and whatever else going on in our hearts. See, platitudes, are that's not faith. It's active when we, when we are literally acting on it. Actively trusting God means this. When a problem or temptation comes, we apply our knowledge of who God is and what he has said in his word. I want to say that again. Actively trusting God means when a problem or a temptation comes, <clears throat> we apply our knowledge of who God is and what he has said in his word. Martin Lloyd-Jones said this, Faith here means the ability to apply quickly what we believe so as to repel everything the devil does or attempts to do in us. See, that's what active faith does. Is it shuts the door on the enemy before he even has a chance to start his shenanigans. Actively apply what we believe so that we can repel the enemy. That's active faith, guys. And that's exactly what Joseph displayed with his encounter with Potiphar's wife that I told you about a minute ago. He says in Genesis 39, 9, how could I do such a wicked thing and sin against God? Get that. He didn't make it about himself. 
he didn't even make it about the temptation. Get that. It was about God. It was about his relationship with God. It was about his not wanting to break that fellowship with God. So his response was indeed God-centered all the way. His faith was based on his experience of God's faithfulness. His faith in God was the motivation and strength he needed to get out of that temptation. And get this, his faith was not, his faith was not conditional on God's immediate provision. Guys, we're going to say that again. Our faith is not conditional on God's immediate provision. In other words, I'll have faith when God comes through. No, that's not faith. See, God did not, or Jesus, excuse me, Joseph did not honor God because God delivered him from the trouble. He honored God by running from the trouble, period, regardless of the circumstances. And by the way, he was thrown in prison for that. Oswald Chambers says this. This is an awesome quote. Faith for my deliverance is not faith in God. Faith means whether I am visibly delivered or not, I will stick to my belief that God is love. There are some things only learned in a fiery furnace. <laughs> wow, what an attitude. God delivered me from this, but more than that, your will be done. That's exactly what Jesus prayed in the Garden of Gethsemane, by the way. Not my will done, but yours. God, if, you can, if there's another way to do this besides me doing this, Father, please let it happen. Otherwise, not my will, but yours be done. So we've talked a lot about faith today, guys. What's the opposite as I close here? The opposite of faith is unbelief. And we should take unbelief very seriously, guys. I believe God does. See, we are living in a time when faith and hope are going to be our lifelines. It's not our opinions. It's not our the way that we see things and the way we can argue and all of that. It's faith and hope that are going to be our lifelines. And we must be on the guard against unbelief. Let me just tell you quickly some, some dangers of unbelief. First of all, it's unpleasing to God. It's not pleasing to God. It's displeasing to him. It shows that we don't trust him. And the thing about unbelief is that it will lead to action. You always act on what you was going, what's going on inside. That's why we call it acting out. You're acting out what you're already acting in. What does that look like in a practical sense? I don't know. How about murmuring? How about complaining? How about when we take our eyes off of God and put them on the circumstances, which would be so easy to do right now? When we do that, we start looking at the problem through our human eyes, and then we will eventually take matters into our own hands. That's what we do. We act on it. See, the biggest danger we risk with unbelief, though, is missing what God has for us. That is the danger that should scare us to death. Unbelief can cause you to miss what God has for you. So as I conclude, guys, what is God saying to you? What has been God, God been saying to you during this pandemic? Is he calling you out of your past? Is he calling you into a new season? Is he wanting you to, is he wanting to render something in your past, obsolete, but perhaps you keep taking it back. God is calling us to believe he can do what he said he will do. Let's say that again. God is calling us to believe he, he can do what he said he will do. That's faith, and that gives us hope, guys. Jesus said these words Mark, in Mark 9, 23. Everything is possible for one who believes. Jesus said that. I didn't say that. So, guys, I want you to hear me, please, as I, as I, as I conclude. God's not asking you to work harder. God's not asking you to argue more. God's not asking you to do this, that, or the other thing. He says, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray. But see, you're not going to do that without faith. You're not going to do that without belief. So he's asking us to believe him. 
and we will indeed find hope in that belief. Amen. I hope you received that today. Let me pray. Father, so much, so much today, Lord. So much put out there. So much said about faith. So much said, Father, about our part of it. But God, that's only our part. You have the heavier lifting. You're the one that moves mountains. (laughs) You're the one that does miracles. You're the one that undoes and heals pasts. I can't do that. You're the one that can set the captive free. You're the one that can make the blind person see. You're the one that heals the lame man. We just have to believe and join you in that process through belief and obedience, Lord. I pray that we, we, we would indeed be that church, Father, that can rise to the occasion like that. He Indeed, heal our land, Lord. We need it desperately, Father, but start with us. Start with me, Lord. Heal me, Father. I believe. Help me in my unbelief. Father, I pray for each couple. I pray for each home that's represented right now. I pray that you would bind them together in love. In the time remaining of this pandemic, Lord, I pray, God, that love would be the norm in those households. Households. I pray, Father, for healing in marriages. I pray, God, for healing in hearts. I pray for the healing in our city. I pray for healing in our country, Lord. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Bless you guys. Love you. We'll see you soon.